everyone hello hello everyone can you hear me in the back perfect okay thanks a lot for all being here today uh, we're very happy to see you here today my, my name is Kian I'm I'm a member of the board of directors of uh, the Persian Student Association at Stanford also known as the PSA uh, the PSA constantly tries to organize some activities for the Iranian students on campus and beyond with alumni. We, we, we are very, very fortunate to have you here. We, we organize sometimes, uh, sometimes it can be poetry nights, sometimes we organize uh, networking events, meetups, sometimes Persian parties. And I see good dancers around here. <laughs> However, we, we really wanted to have a very special event one time in the year. And our goal was to, to have an event where we could, everyone could attend, both students, alumni, and professionals of the Valley. And on the other hand, have an event where we could get an insight from an expert of the Valley, someone who was here, someone who is known for that. And this goal to organize this event was highly aligned with the goal of the ISA, the Iranian Stanford Alumni Association. And and the ISA is encouraging uh, the interaction between many generations of alumni from, of alumni from Stanford and trying to encourage the, the, this interaction and keep the community working together. We're very fortunate, the PSA and the ISA, to have today with us Omid Kordestani. Omid Kordestani started his career about 30 years ago in the Valley first as a product marketing manager at HP, before having many, many experiences in different startups. You may have heard of, uh, of a gaming uh, company, interactive gaming company called 3 do or of an early smartphone uh, innovator called Geo Corporation. After these steps, Omid decided to join Netscape in 1995, as you know, uh, a, a pioneer in the internet industry. He ended up uh, eventually leading the business and the sales development as a vice president of Netscape. Four years after that, and you may know the story, he decided in 1999 to join Google as employee number 11. He is famous for being the business founder, as we say, of Google leading Google from the first set of employees and the first dollars in revenue to more than 12,000 employees and more than $20 billion in revenues. He has spent 10 years holding executive positions in, in Google and has pursued his passion, his passion in science, in education, in, in, uh, in uh, education, science, and medicine as well as an advisor and an investor in many startups. Uh, today, Omid is the executive chairman of Twitter and he has kindly accepted to share his vision of the future, his experience in the Valley with us uh, in this fireside, fireside chat uh, talk that will be moderated by my dear friend Reza and which is sponsored by uh, the Graduate Business School Terry Management Center and the Iranian studies from the Hamid and Christina Mohaddam program. Thank you and welcome Omid Kordestani. So first of all, um, I want to thank the PSA, the Stu uh, Persian Student Association and the Alumni Association for inviting me, very kind of you. And for all of you who decided to take uh, time from the sunny afternoon in California, which uh, has been rare uh, recently to be here to, to, to listen to this. And I hope I can share uh, some interesting thoughts with you. But um, first and foremost, I also want to really uh, thank my dear friends who are here. My wife is here also. Um, but uh, Mr. Mogadam, Mr. Milani, who are a big part of the Stanford community, and, and uh, Saeed Amit Huzur, who is a big uh, uh, dear friend and uh, uh, an entrepreneur in the Valley who has inspired me along the way. Um, but also I have to point out something. You know, we all, we all uh, in our older age now, we have uh, picked up all kinds of sports, golf and tennis, and, uh, and we were actually very competitive with each other. So the first complaint I hear when I come in, because we're very, you know, always betting money against each other and in the sports, 
uh, Said is very upset that uh, you guys used a very young, young picture of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't give any edge to uh, you can't give any edge to me, especially when it comes to books or or sports. So, sorry, Said. So, <laughs> but. Um, uh, in any case, one, one of the things that uh, we talked about was uh, I love to do a fireside chat format so that we can make this interactive and um, I'm a pretty open person and would love to touch on any topics of interest uh, by, by the uh, tremendous IQ represented in this room uh, by this wonderful person, students, um, but also from the audience. So I'm happy to, uh, happy to touch on any topics and cover uh, any ground while we have this time together today. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you everyone for being here, and thank you Omid for being here on this funny afternoon, I know, from your busy schedule, we, we appreciate it a lot. My pleasure. And people love you, people love you a lot, and thank they you. all have come to use your expertise and, and wisdom uh, as, we will, as we will chat about. Uh, so, how's it going? How does it feel to be back at Stanford? It's uh, it, it's so uh, wonderful to be back. Um, first, jealous of all these wonderful facilities you have, and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the business school, for example, where I where I went to, uh, which is not as a serious degree as the PhD in electrical engineering, but. Uh, uh, you know, back then it was this this building that uh, I, I was surprised it survived the earthquake of '89 uh, <laughs> when I was here. And now the facility looks like uh, uh, just uh, a place you want to actually live in, which I know you guys spend a lot of time in these buildings and student centers, uh, studying hard. But it's wonderful to be here and also to be able to uh, share any uh, of. Uh, uh, lessons in life or lessons in career that I've had that I could hopefully inspire in any of you to do great things in life and in your career. So, happy sure. To be here. Yeah, and I'm sure when st you know, some of the students from this room will be back here 10 years from now, Absolutely. 20, 20 yes. years from now, as distinguished speakers, they're going to have the same experience. Absolutely. Uh, and you, you went to the GSP here, yes. right? And did, uh, I'm going to apologize to any GSP students who are here, which I know I do, uh, but GSP students don't, uh, don't often hang out outside the GSP. So have you, have you been to these buildings and these areas before? Yeah, you know, I, um, first of all, when I got into the GSP, I was so, uh, well, I'm actually a step back. When I came here from Iran, uh, I, I had this classic story of an immigrant, which was I was influenced by media. Uh, American media in Iran. You know, I went to a Catholic Italian school called Andy Sheridan Bosco in Iran, and uh, and unfortunately, I lost my father to cancer those, uh, uh, when I was about twelve. And um, uh, back then, a lot of Iranian students who could were basically middle class and up, which I was smack middle class. My father was an engineer, and my mother was a nurse. Uh, they would try to send their children abroad for studies because you would have a, more choices of majors. You know, in, in Iran, you know, you had the national exam, and your name would show up in a newspaper, and I would be, I would be having to compete with someone like you and you know, <laughs> to to get into electrical engineering, and I would clearly not make it. So uh, uh, you just would go, you, you would just go. You, you would just go abroad so that you have a chance of getting uh, into a degree that, that you like. But anyway, make a long story short, my uh, vision of America was influenced by this show called The Jeffersons, which was this family, African-American family, uh, who was living in Manhattan. And uh, the theme song for that TV series was, uh, one of the top songs was Moving On Up, which was all very <laughs> serendipitous. And, uh, and, uh, and so I imagine I'm coming to this place that looks like Manhattan, and I arrived in the middle of San Jose, California, which <laughs> as, much as, as much as I love as my second city, adopted it city. Doesn't look much it doesn't different. look like Manhattan. <laughs> so, and especially compared to Tehran, which even back then was such a bustling, you know, metropolis. So, um, um, and to make a long story short, when I arrived here, not only did I imagine all of America looks like Manhattan, I also imagined um, and you know, when you lose your father also, um, even though I had a very strong woman, my mom in my life, uh, you kind of lose your bearing, you know, you, you, this, this light in your life that gives you advice. And so my advice was based on whatever I could glom on, you know, friends and colleagues and 
Uh, you should see how many times I've gone to Hamid's office to get his advice in life and career changes and so forth. So that was just the mode I, I've, I was in and I'm still I'm in. And um, uh, uh, anyway, make a long story short, I went to San Jose State University to study double engineering. Assuming all universities in America are the same, they are all great places, and I got a fantastic education there. But then I realized, wow, there is Ivy League schools, there is UC schools, there is like a school like Stanford. And later in life, it was a dream for me to then make it Did to... Did you like to, electrical engineering? I loved electrical engineering. And um, I was very lucky um, in my life because even though I was a good engineer, I probably would have not been a great engineer. Um, and I got amazing offers uh, to these great companies. That you, probably, you may not know the names now. They're all these microwave technology companies like Wiltron and um, Avantech, I think one of them was called. Mm -hmm. uh, and this recruiter from Hewlett Packard changed the direction of my career. He basically said, Omid, your personality is not an engineer. You're like an extrovert and you, uh, you should consider a product management uh, degree. And that led to my career change to HP. And that also led to me saying I need a proper uh, high-end business education, and that's what made me apply to Stanford and put all my energy into getting to, to this school. So you worked at, uh, at HP for four years, and, yes. then, and then, then went to Stanford for an MBA degree for, for two an MBA years, degree, yeah. and then went uh, to the real world again. So back to your original question, you know, people that get into the business school, I think with all due respect um, to <laughs> all our friends, you think you're just like now ready to be the CEO of the fortune company, uh, you, know, you're, you know, you made that cut, that small percentage of the population that gets into the school and then to the business school. And uh, was this what you wanted? And you know, what I really wanted was a reset of, or confidence in my um, studies because you study engineering and as you all know, um, and today's world by the way is different. You know, can you believe it? I went to business school when there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> So, there's no Google. Yeah, there's no Google. And so today's world is so different because I think the engineering students have um, not only an amazing education in their core studies, but they have access to this wonderful, vast knowledge of the world, uh, like everybody does now, the way uh, internet has uh, democratized information. So I think it's a very different world today. But back then, you know, I had to come here, I have to spend time in the libraries, in the case study groups, in the team groups. And that was not only a great education, but also opportunity to, to network and kind of build your confidence and uh, meet other alumni uh, to be inspired about your career steps. And that's, that's, uh, that's what Stanford was amazing. Mm -hmm. What did you for. do after business school? So, um, so I had the same disease. After the, after <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I can be easily a CEO of a, of a company and I'm gonna go pursue a, a startup. And uh, I joined um, this company called Go, which was an uh, early smartphone operating system company. And, like, and a lot of you in technology know this, uh, history repeats itself. You know, and the, the, this idea of smartphones uh, uh, was you know, back in 91 when I graduated, uh, was beginning. And uh, uh, we were focused on the wrong problem at the time. We were focused on uh, recognizing handwriting, which to this day, we can't do well. Maybe with machine learning, we can do better now. But um, back then, uh, we had gestures. You know, we had you, ha uh, you had this ability to do a lot of the things that smartphones do today. But we were trying to solve this really tough problem, which was handwriting recognition, and the devices didn't have the right, you know, battery lives and screen uh, technology and all those other issues. So these devices look, looked like the big iPads of today with a phone attached to the top. <laughs> it's just like, when you look back at early, you know, when you look at it, it's just, oh, this was way too early. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, uh, but one of the things that if, if I can share with you as far as one of the best advice I can give you is that the thing that matters is that experience. And that experience, I and mean, this is a cliche, you know, the Silicon Valley is good for failure uh, because you can, you can take risks. That is absolutely true. Um, this ability to, to take risks and learn from it and move on is a fundamental part of how the startup uh, life works here in the Valley. But the other important aspect of it is the network you build. Mm -hmm. So in that company, I got exposed to some incredible uh, leaders that became mentors and advisors over, uh, over my career for me. So, 
the late Bill Campbell uh, was the CEO of that company. Uh, the late Mike Homer was a VP of product management there. And all these pe co people, two companies later, which was Netscape, became my coaches and mentors and supporters to kind of propel my career because I had this experience with them where as amazing as it was and as early as it was, it was a failure. But it's, it's kind of like going through army together or going through a boot camp together. You know, you, 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 you do your best and uh, at the end it didn't work out, but these people know this is the kind of person that can um, you know, fight with me in the next, in the next battle, in the, in the next innovation cycle. So that's what's amazing about these experiences is not just the risk taking, but also the network you build and the relationships you build. Yeah, and it's very hard to keep your network after you leave somewhere and you could, could do it perfectly. Yeah, and this, this area is fantastic for that. And I think people, and this is one of the things that I, again, also recommend to the engineering students uh, is that um, uh, the, the, the brilliance and the, 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 the high IQ and the ability that engineers have to, to work on problems Obviously, that's a tremendous skill. But some of the most successful entrepreneurs, and this is a credit to Larry and Sergey, they surrounded themselves with, 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 with advisors and people from the early days that, that um, uh, helped them at every step of the way. So I'll give you an example. When, when I got this call uh, to go meet them, and as a separate story, I can answer your questions about mm -hmm. uh, Google later, uh, but uh, they did a reference check on me. like. Up and down. So they, they had Stanford computer science advisors of them call me up, meet me for coffee, and to try to evaluate is this guy a real, real serious technologist uh, or just a kind of a, a random business leader that has, success, that has successfully navigated his career. Uh, they wanted the real technologist. They didn't want just a business leader. Uh, but um, incredible people that were part of their network, you know, did these reference checks and. Um, and that network and those relationships is what helps you because they didn't necessarily even care to interview me. They wanted to know who I worked for and mm -hmm. they would call those people and confirm that, you know, is this guy real or not. So that's how they made sure they wanted to yeah. work with you. But at the time, you were a very successful VP at, at Netscape, which just got acquired by AOL. By AOL. Yeah. And you, could, you, you did have a lot of different opportunities. But you meet with these two people, Larry and Sergey, and they somehow convince you to like let, leave every opportunity be behind and say yeah. no to everything and join them. What did they have? Like, what was it about them that you liked? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, you know, I had two companies that had failed before Netscape. So one was Go, and the other one was 3DO, this um, interactive gaming company. And then after that, it was Netscape, which was very successful. Uh, but then it reached this, this point where you know, I was living this fancy corporate life. I had access to corporate jets and large organization I was running and a big title. Um, but I just knew that as part of AOL, I, I, I won't, I, this company won't be necessarily as innovative and as hard charging. Uh, with all the respect to AOL. I just felt like AOL is a media company over time and it's going to be a different kind of company than a technology company. And the, back then, some of the leaders that I met also at AOL, they were just very different kind of culture than, than Silicon Valley. I, I, I never forget one of, one of the guys, um, uh, I never get sick, <laughs> luckily. Um, <laughs> but uh, somehow, I got called to a meeting to discuss the acquisition. And um, I, I had this weird kind of an ear uh, infection where I was kind of wobbly. And I said, you know, this is the worst way to like meet the future bosses and the, the, the people that are part of this decision making. So I missed that meeting. And instead of like them saying, okay, this was this guy, this poor guy was sick, they took that as a, they took that as a, a signal that I'm not interested in, in, in this kind of being part of this company. So the next day uh, that I was back at work, this limo arrives. And this is so on Silicon Valley. I mean, today we have Uber. We were used to it. But back then, this black limo pulls up. And, and the head of the business comes and says, uh, oh, maybe let's go to breakfast. And, and it was like 10.30. And it was like, I already had breakfast. But we go, we go sit in the back of the limo. And, and he says to me, Omid, oh, um, there are acquisitions and there are mergers. And this was an acquisition. Uh, and I said, uh, am I going to end up in the trunk of this limo now? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was like, like the East Coast Mafia coming to the valley. And, mm. and um, so what happened then is like, I, um, 
I just knew culturally I'm not going to fit there. Okay. And, uh, and what happened at, at that moment was I literally got a call from, from Google. Um, no, sorry, not a call. I got this report. You know, Google, um, AOL didn't have its own search engine. Netscape didn't have its own search engine. We were actually selling our traffic to other search engines. So the, the little button that was on the Netscape browser, which was the world search traffic, was coming to us. Uh, it's another whole story about why Netscape kind of lost its way early on. But, mm -hmm. but that traffic was actually being sold to other search providers like Yahoo and InfoSeek and um, a lot of <laughs> other search engine companies back at the time. But to answer your question, I was just yearning for that moment of simplicity and risk taking again. So uh, I was um, you know, getting to an age where you know, I already had two young kids at the time. And I knew that I have one more high-risk company in me. Mm -hmm. And when Larry and Sergey called and I met them, I had this whole background of AOL in the back of my head. I had this understanding of search technology and how it really works and how lucrative it can be. And then I met Larry and Sergey, and I later on shared this story with a lot of my employees at, at Google, is that in their eyes, I just saw this burning uh, innovation and mindset uh, that it didn't matter what we were building. So what I, what I kind of decided to do was just to join that team for the journey. And, mm -hmm. and I decided that these guys are so, such innovators and such brilliant people that one day, you know, who knows, we may build a mattress, but it would be the most amazing <laughs> mattress and it would probably fly and, you know, do all <laughs> kinds of things. And, and, and so for me, it was not important what we were building. It was that I'm going to be part of this team that is going to be so innovative and interesting to weave next to. And, and you know, this is one of the other pieces of advice I have for people, at, at, is you have to, in your career, make uncomfortable, make yourself uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If you get too comfortable, um, uh, you just miss those discontinuities and miss those opportunities to join the next uh, great venture. Um, um, when you joined to Google, what were you thinking about the future of the company? Like, did you have any... Uh, simpler exit strategies in mind, or did you think that Google would be this big as it is today? You know, no, I mean, nobody, I mean, even Larry and Sergey didn't, you know. I, I think they, they knew they're gonna, again, build an amazing technology, but nobody knew it's gonna be this huge business and this, because it's not just about the brilliance, and this is what you'll see as you develop your careers. A lot of other things have to go right. You know, I talked about the timing mm -hmm. of innovation. Uh, so it happened that search engines, there were a lot of search engines at the time, but they were doing a terrible job. They were like not keeping up with the amount of growth that was happening on the web. Their indexes of information were small. The algorithms weren't smart enough. So all you were getting was like poor information. You were getting lots of ads that were untargeted. So it was this amazing opening, which is this is a huge use case that people are doing. Their people are searching for information, but then uh, the products weren't great. So here's a company that is so pure and has such focus on great technology and a great product experience. The other thing that has to go right is the timing has to be right. So we were lucky when the internet bubble burst mm -hmm. because there were all these PhDs working at pets.com and all these other places and they were bored to death. When those companies went away, we were able to attract this incredible talent to the company. And uh, a lot of those PhDs are there now today. They're fellows, they're part of the AI teams. They're just an incredible talent base that, that Google has. And, and uh, so it was timing, that your timing had to be good. And you have to be lucky. You know, we, the, uh, the, the fact that you know, I was able to kind of survive those early days and build this relationship with Larry and Sergey, the fact that we did this important deal with Yahoo and AOL that actually helped us propel our business forward. Um, some of the smart acquisitions we made, some of the talent we acquired. So a lot of things have to go right for these ventures to become successful. It's not just about the technology and, and the people. How did it change in the, in the, in the later times? Uh, like when you joined at Google, there were 10 people and basically no revenue. Yeah. And then uh, when you left, there were, as Ken said, 12,000 employees and $20 billion revenue. Uh, what did you do to make sure that you survived this massive growth? Yeah. The, 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 the main thing you do is the culture of the company and, and the culture of the company that keeps that excellence in, in everything you're doing. Excellence in the way you're working on products and technology, excellence in hiring. I would say probably the most important thing the company has done, and Larry and Sergey wrote this in their founder's letter, is that 
our employees are everything. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true. Uh, the, without those employees, without that innovation, not only the original success wouldn't have happened, but the follow-on success wouldn't have happened. So um, there's this famous saying, I don't know who, who coined it, but I certainly used it in my career, which was you, A player, A players hire A players, and B players hire C players, and C players hire D players. So mm -hmm. at Google, this is pretty much the standard that's kept um, um, intact, I believe. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, the, you, know, you know, I had the pleasure of hiring someone like Sheryl Sandberg to work for me, who's now the CEO of Facebook. And not only was that uh, a lucky moment in the company's history, but um, it was a lucky moment for Cheryl, and she says that, mm -hmm. and a lucky moment for me because I had this incredible uh, talent uh, as part of my organization. And, and we learned from each other, we challenged each other, we built this incredible aspects of the operations of the company together. So uh, it's, to me, that's probably the foundation of a success for a lot of these companies, is the ability to keep the standard of hiring that high. And you joined Twitter uh, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that too? Uh, yeah. wh why did you choose to uh, yeah. join Twitter? And we've been uh, hearing some news about Twitter, like uh, they sold fabric to, to, Google, to Google and they shut down Vine. And there are a lot of changes going on. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that too? Yeah, so Twitter is a um, um, couple of things. One, I want to give credit to my wife. Uh, I was debating one night about this opportunity to join them. And I asked Giselle, uh, what do you think? You know, do you really think this service uh, is that unique? And she reminded me that um, you know, there are a lot of messaging services today, and Twitter is not really a messaging service anymore. It's much more important as a, um, as a source of what's happening now and understanding of what's going on in the world and then the ability to have a dialogue around it. Uh, but she said, you know, if, if some of these messaging apps go away, there are all these alternatives I have today. But Twitter is special. If it goes away, something special will be missed. And that's what's really stuck with me, that it's such a unique service. And, um, and I always felt like it has this incredible potential that's unfulfilled. Um, and that's uh, one reason I joined. The other reason I joined was um, the uncomfortable comment I made uh, about making your careers uh, always looking for that moment where you can learn more and challenge yourself more and make those uncomfortable choices. So once again, I was at this position. Larry actually asked me to come out of retirement <laughs> and go back to Google to help with this transition to Alphabet, the holding company. That's 2014. And that was 2014. And when I went back to Google to do that, it was this incredible journey working with Larry and the team again to help transition Google into a holding company. And at the end of that process, once we decided Sundar is the best choice for the CEO for the company and the holding company got formed. Then Larry wanted me to stay on as an advisor again. And I just decided, you know, this is another one of those moments where I'm going to, you know, have this high, you know, this high class problem. You know, I'm going to have this amazing position. I'm going to have this amazing platform. I'm going to get paid really well but I'm going to be just playing with the dials. <laughs> like, you know, there's so many smart people in this company. The CEO is incredible at Google now. Uh, and I'm going to just be sitting there as this high-end advisor, and I need something more challenging. So when I met Jack, uh, I just got sold right away. It, 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 the fact that here's a founder who's back and has another job, by the way, <laughs> CEO <laughs> of Square. And in he's taking on something really uncomfortable to try to help Twitter achieve its true potential. And if I can, part, if I can be part of that journey, it's just going to be amazing again. And that's mm -hmm. why I chose to, to join, because I think this company is really special, as you see today, the, the dialogue that's happening, uh, uh, the, 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 the dangers to our democracy, not just in the US, but across the world, the information flow that's happening, the dialogue that's happening. The, um, you know, the supreme leader of Iran making a commentary to, to the president of the United <laughs> States and that dialogue happening on Twitter not only is important, but uh, it's also an incredible source of entertainment these days. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's what's so special, I think, about that. That is very true. Yeah. And in that journey, what, 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 uh, what steps Twitter has done recently on you know, changing stuff? Jack Dorsey, <coughs> a, few, a few days yeah. ago, published something about, published a short uh, remark about you know, how they're focusing on the advertisers and they want to yeah. use the you know, instantaneous um, 
you know, feature of Twitter. Yeah. Um, so what, what steps are you, are you guys doing? Yeah, Twitter? absolutely. So when I, when I came to Twitter, and I, one of the things that was so special is Jack and I had the same mindset, which is here's this incredibly successful company, but yet it's challenged for various reasons. Um, and without going into the history of why it got there, the problem is these technology companies are only successful if the technologists are actually in charge, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, as a business leader. You cannot have business leaders in charge of technology companies, in my opinion. So uh, what happened is Jack, as a technology founder, being back, um, you need to have incredible business leadership and capability in the company, but they need to follow the technology and product innovation path, not the other way around. So one of the things that we've done at Twitter is over the last year really spent time to, to establish that discipline, to raise the voice of the technologists at the company, to, to, to have Jack spend a lot of time with the product leadership so that um, the focus is on rapid product innovation, to continually improve the core service for the existing users, but also to take bets so that we can propel the innovation of the company. And then, uh, and then the same thing now needs to happen on the business side. What happened over the uh, last several years is that Twitter was hot as a property that advertisers just wanted to be associated with, especially brand advertisers that are always after the next hot property. Those kinds of advertising dollars and budgets are very flimsy because they mm -hmm. always follow the next hot thing. Um, and, and what Google did really well and what Facebook did really well and what Twitter is going to do really well next is really focus on a business model that fits its, its, its um, core service, mm -hmm. not the other way around again, not go after any advertising model or advertising business. So even though in the short term, we had to do a reset basically on the business, which we just did this last week, um, we are confident in our ability to innovate there. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the other thing you have to realize. It's, it's like in Silicon Valley, you know, um, a, comp a company that has hundreds of millions of users and it has this kind of awareness where the presidents of, of, of uh, our, our, our world are having a dialogue and fights <laughs> and conversations with each other. Uh, uh, you know, every headline you read is like putting this scrutiny on this company that, oh, is it going to survive? Is it going to last this? Is it going to last that? Uh, internally in the company, it's a very different story. You know, the people are committed. There's this incredible love and energy there. And... Um, uh, and it's not easy. It's not, and this is what I went for, and this is what I recommend you guys do in your careers, is that when you can afford it and when, you can, when you, it's right for you in your career path, and um, again, you have to consider all the other things, all the other parameters, um, you know, your family life, your other commitments, but always try to push yourself to take those risks because you learn from them and your career propels because mm -hmm. of it. And since you mentioned technology, I'm curious about what you think about the future of technology. You've been working in yeah. the Valley for more than 30 years now. You've seen uh, you know, companies like Go and you know, yeah. last generation of desktop PC and then to mobile and now Internet of Things and uh, drones. So what, what, what is about the future that interests you? And do you, is there any small companies that you like or mm -hmm. personally invest in? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm... I'm very optimistic about the future of technology, and, and one of the, um, I think one of the best, best recent uh, uh, talks I, I learned a lot from was this uh, TED talk I listened to. I forget who was actually speaking. I have this commute to San Francisco now, so I, I have a lot of time to listen to great content mm -hmm. and um, podcasts. And, and it, this, this speaker was talking about the role of AI today and the impact it's going to have on employment and the worry that the world has about these jobs disappearing. There certainly is going to be a short-term pain in, 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 the, in the entire uh, global um, workforce because these changes are disruptive and it's going to, it's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. And all of us need to come together to find solutions to hopefully make, it, make, make these transitions easier. But uh, the example I was using what, what AI did recently with AlphaGo, which was Google's um, uh, DeepMind technology beating uh, uh, a world champion in Go, which is one of the most strategic and difficult uh, board games. Um, uh, and then what IBM Blue did uh, uh, in, uh, similarly in chess. And the talk was about the fact that um, you know, humans probably won't be able to beat, it, beat the machine again in the game. Mm -hmm. But what's happening now is that the team has changed. It's not, it's not the human now playing with another player. Is, is the fact that there's a team of humans and machine now together doing mm -hmm. things. 
And I think that's what's really going to happen with, with AI and machine learning and all of this, these, these technologies is that the more mundane jobs is going to be taken on by machines. So the radiologists who had to do some of the most basic tasks, those things can be done better with machines now. I mean, one of you guys is studying uh, 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 computer vision, for example, right? So mm -hmm. I, I really want uh, the capability of a doctor plus a machine learning if I have a tumor. You know, I, I, I much rather have that than just the trained eyes of a doctor now because I want all that knowledge and know-how that technology can also supplement that doctor with. So what I'm hopeful about is the way to think about technology and what's going to happen with AI and machine learning is it's like it's another form of utility. It's going to be like flowing like electricity um, and, and supplementing everything else that we're doing. It's like a utility for human beings. And, um, and that's what, um, um, in fact, even you can buy it today that way. You can buy access to Google's AI API. Um, I forget exactly what the price is, but it's like uh, some number of cents per, per thousand hits or so. Mm -hmm. so. So that's what's really happening with the, this, this powerful innovation that's, ha uh, that's, that's going on. Now, will it replace some of these jobs that are getting lost in, um, in the center of our country here? And, uh, you know, uh, probably not, but, I, but I'm much more hopeful of what the future jobs will be and that the retooling that needs to happen and the education that needs to happen, um, that's what's exciting. Mm, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind now, like we can switch gears and talk about more personal lessons sure, of your life. Sure. Uh, I have As though I haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about technology for the past few minutes. Yeah. Uh, sure. But um, I've seen an interesting video of you uh, at, at University of uh, San Jose State University commencement, which is very interesting. And in that, uh, you talk about three aha moments in your life. Uh, do, do you want to talk about them and tell me if you have any aha moments, have had any aha moments since? Yeah. Uh, I I really look for them. You know, I, I, I just feel like life is full of um, delightful surprises and, and that I think the most successful people who are the ones who are really in tune with these twists and turns that life brings to them. So um, again, if I may talk about my own personal experience, you know, when my father died, that was a moment for me that could have, whatever, made me go become depressed or get into drugs or, you know, give up on life and career. But in reality, what happened was the combination of my mother's leadership, always strong women, I believe in strong women in your life, surround yourself with them, include them in your teams, um, is that uh, that became a leadership palette for me. As actually, and some of it was hard because as a 14 year old, if your mom kind of looks at you as a head of the family, you know, that's another stress on its own. But, but that was also an opportunity to kind of jump into a leadership role and decide on where we're going to move to and mm -hmm. the next house we may live in and, and the next career and risks. And I took a lot of risks. And thanks to my mother, I, she put up with them and, and supported me. Um, but these moments kind of present themselves, you know, like that lunch meeting I had with Larry and Sergey. It's just this moment that I realized I can be comfortable at AOL aside from that limo ride, but I, I can be comfortable there and I can have a cush job. And, and um, by the way, I even did a spreadsheet. This is like shows you the mistakes you can make. And I, I did a spreadsheet talking about money now for a second. Uh, when you asked about, did I know how successful Google mm -hmm. is going to be? I did a spreadsheet and completely with my technical education, forgetting the law of large numbers, because my stock at Netscape had gone from $15 to 75 after the AOL acquisition. That was like an incredible rise. I said, well, well, that kind of a rise is impossible to continue, but doubling of the stock every year is possible. Like, <laughs> I was just like completely forgetting the market cap of AOL and the fact that it's impossible for it to double every year, forgetting the law of large numbers. I assumed that in my spreadsheet and what kind of shares I had at AOL. And then for Google, I had Luckily, I was able to negotiate a, a nice percentage of the company at the time. I had assumed that we're going to sell Google to some company for a couple hundred million dollars, and my share would be, you know, whatever, $3 million. And I, I said, well, that kind of looks very similar to my AOL income. And uh, I kind of looked at it and said, well, it's not about the money. Where am I going to have more fun? And I decided to go with Google. So it just shows you, and I picked that decision not because I had negotiated a great 
you know, deal with uh, Google and have a big, become a kind of a, almost like a founder of the company. But the fact that uh, I, I, that aha moment for the, that moment was, you know, I'm going to just learn a lot more. I'm going to have a lot more fun and I'm at a point in my life where I can take this risk. And I did that. So um, I would say this, the same aha moment has happened to me with my conversation with my, my wife about joining Twitter, Twitter. where it would have been much more comfortable staying at Google <laughs> again and not being beat up in the press every day or, you know, getting nasty tweets uh, about, you know, whenever, whenever I make a comment about uh, the, the, the craziness that's going on with our current president, uh, he, uh, the, you know, I get these nasty tweets like, you know, pay more attention to the Twitter stock or like, you know, go fix the problems with Jack and <laughs> like, you know, so, so I, would, I would have been a lot more comfortable uh, staying at Google <laughs> than, than what's going on at, at, at Twitter now. On the other hand, I'm just loving what I'm doing every day now. I'm learning a lot more. I'm challenged a lot more. And, and, um, and um, that's, I would say, another recent special moment for me. Yeah. And speaking of the current president, I want to bring this up that yeah. uh, over the past few years, over the past decades, actually, yeah. a lot of immigrants uh, came to this country, a lot of smart people. You are one who you helped grow yeah. Google, which now hires more than like tens of thousands of employees. Saida, maybe Hamid Mogaddam, and like the list goes on and on and on. Yes. Like I don't, I don't want to na say names here, but uh, uh, yeah, many of these people were from those seven countries that yes. are listed in the executive order. Uh, and uh, what, what do you think about the role of immigrants in, in America's economy yeah. and more specifically yeah. high tech industry? Absolutely. No, happy to address that. So I'm going to stand up for this because I'm passionate about this issue. <laughs> going to get into a fight. Thank you. Thank you. So I, first of all, I just want to say I am one of you. I'm an immigrant. And, and I've been lucky to have the doors of this country be uh, open to me and welcome me. But I want to put it in context. You know, when I came here, I was lucky in one respect because I came totally unrelated to what was going on in Iran. I arrived here because of my father had passed away, and it was right before the revolution. But then the revolution happened, the Iran-Iraq war happened, and the hostage crisis happened. So I was a student in high school here during a lot of that. And I faced, you know, the same kind of pressures or fears that you may be facing today, those of you who are students today, I was on a student visa. Um, at one point, I think President Reagan uh, put a ban on travel on in, in Iranian students and you had to go fingerprint yourself. And, and um, so what I want to say is, you know, I went through all this and survived it. And, and all of you s students who are here, stick to your guns, stick to your focus on your studies, stick to the laws of this country and what makes this country incredible. Not only is this amazing people, even the ones who may be on the other side now supporting the president and, and some of his policies, I, I, I fundamentally believe that American people are incredible people, they're welcoming people, and dialogue and conversation and the laws of this country is what ultimately propels uh, this great nation forward. So I think, um, you know, I survived that and I think we're going to survive this in a similar way. Um, and the power of the internet today and information today and tools like Twitter and Facebook and others enables this conversation to be magnified and to be accessible a lot faster. Um, and uh, so first and foremost, I think these are experiences that happen in these countries and it's part of the, I believe, growth of this country and this country gets better from it uh, by going through these tough experiences because the alternative is worse. If these kind of pressures that this country faced that led to the election of President Trump, if those things would have not come out, if those things would have led to more uh, disruptions in the country, if that led to more uh, alienation, uh, then, then there will be tanks on the streets, which happens in a lot of other countries. And, and there will be much, much worse situations that develop. So don't be scared of, of some of the rhetoric or some of the just the back and forth that happens now as we face these challenges in this country. Fundamentally, if you're here legally, if you're here on a student visa and you're a good person and, 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 and the president ha has made a move that, that in my opinion is, is, is incorrect and misinformed, there are ways to fight it. There's ways to educate it. Just the way as a student in high school, I was able to deal with some of the bullies in the high school and talk to them. 
Um, you, we can now do that with the bullies in different positions in government, perhaps, or uh, in the country, and, and that uh, we, can, we can surpass it and we, we can become great. The other thing I would like to add is that it's a, it's a tweet, actually, I just forwarded by Senator uh, Cory Booker. Uh, I, th I don't know where it's from, but it was a picture that he had taken, and uh, it looked like a church, maybe, or a community center, and basically it said that, uh, uh, you know, for those of us who have been lucky, uh, the answer is for us to have a longer table, not a taller fence. And I believe this country actually is very welcoming, and its foundation was that, and its entire history was based on welcoming immigrants and, and growing from it and becoming better from it. So I think um, this is just a natural part of what this country has to go through, and I wouldn't be afraid of it. I would just be aware of it. I would, I would be engaged. And, and that's what's so incredible is that this country actually allows that. My wife went to the Women's March in DC and uh, flew this crazy flight to get here for that. And, um, and this, this is a country that allows that. This is a country that doesn't show up with machine guns and you know, takes people away and puts them away for marching. So that's, that's what you have to compare it to. And I think um, just very bullish and optimistic on, on, on the future of this country. And you've shown this in action too. Employees of Twitter raised uh, more than five hundred thousand dollars to to uh, for, in donations for a ACLU. And Omid Khorasani and Jack Dorsey, Twitter CEO, personally matched this donation and brought it up to almost one point six million dollars. So, so yeah. that's that's one step. But uh, yeah. the other question is that what else we can do as a community together, yeah. and what is our roles? The people are sitting here in this room. Uh, so, someone like me, someone like you, well, yeah. like, what can each of us do? I think a couple of things. I mean, one is that the fund fundamentally do, do everything that you're good at today. You're a great student, do, what you're get, do, do that job extremely well because what you're going to do next and the companies you're going to help build or the, 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 the great success you're going to become, like the wonderful mathematician that just won the uh, uh, Nobel Prize, I Maria believe, in, in mathematics. What's her name again, sorry? Maria Mirzakhani, it's the Fields Medal. It's equivalent to... F Fields Medal, Yeah. thank you. And so do what you're good at, and, and that's what's going to uh, highlight the power and the, the success of the immigrants. So that's the number one thing. To be engaged, this is what's great about this country. The civic en engagement is, is, is going to... Um, uh, um, uh, it causes this, co this country to become better. I, I, I love one of his recent lines, John Lewis, our congressman, one of the uh, incredible uh, leaders of, of, the, uh, um, uh, uh, of the country. He, uh, he uh, went to one of the airports as this ban was coming on, and I think was talking to someone about this ban, uh, this ban and they were mistreating some of the people that were entering the country, and, and he just simply said, well, looks like we're gonna to have to spend some time here and we're gonna take a seat here. And here's this, I think he's like 70 something years old. Yeah. And, uh, um, and he, he sits down at the airport, a congressman, and, and, and takes, the, takes the time to do this. So we have to do the same in our community. We have to support NIAC and other organizations that and in fact have a fundraiser tomorrow. Um, we have to support any other organization that is, that is actively engaging and lobbying the Congress, uh, lobbying. The, um, uh, the, the, the various organizations basically that cause, uh, that, that's part of the uh, civil engagement that this country encourages and has. So do what you're best at and just and become engaged. And, and, and that's how this country improves. This has been amazing, Omid. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you so much. much. Uh, yeah. We're going to open up to, to questions. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, Omid Khorasani. <laughs> Anyone, anyone has questions? Someone in the back. Ken, over there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you. I have two questions. Uh, a lot of us in the Silicon Valley have this idea of Silicon Valley exceptionalism, where we think that no matter what happens with globalization, um, that um, uh, Silicon Valley will always be the center of what's next in tech innovation. Uh, do, you, do you share this belief? That's my first question. Second question is, has anybody from the White House approached Twitter to build an AI bot to um, make the tweets more presidential? <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a great, uh, great business opportunity, I think. Uh, um, but I, I think um, on your question about Silicon Valley, I, I do think we have something really magical here. The, the fact that uh, students from this great university can literally get on a bike, um, meet a bunch of angel investors and you know, uh, people that have gone through this journey before and get a check for 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, whatever the, their idea is worth at the time. Uh, or may not be worth at the time, <laughs> but basically get, get you know, it, especially in those early stages, people are betting on people. So um, these investors and angels invest when they see a, uh, this bright eyes and innovative mind of an entrepreneur. So on a bike ride, you can go do that with a bunch of investors like Larry and Sergey did, then go over to Page Mill Road and some of the best law firms and, you know, incorporate your company and get best advice. And... Uh, and then uh, hopefully find some real estate these days. Say it may help with that. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I do think this magic is here because the great universities, the great access to the professional services, the funding, the mentorship, um, the great kind of appetite for risk is, is really here. But I wouldn't underestimate what's going on in the rest of the world now. So a lot of countries are now learning this. Um, and watch this carefully. Um, not only do they have a healthy envy for it, but they have the talent base for it that's actually less expensive than the, 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 what's going on in, in this region. Uh, so uh, I also think that we have the opportunity in this country to deal with the divide. Hopefully we can invest more in some of these uh, areas and counties and cities that have fallen behind Silicon Valley and the coasts. And that's what I'm hopeful for as well. I remember when I was um, at Google, Larry uh, went to university in Michigan. And one of the big centers we were going to build, he was adamant that we got to build it there. I know Jack comes from the Midwest as well. And, and um, these people are really in tune with not only the, the value system there that is so strong and so American, but also the opportunities there, that the talent is there and the, the hunger is there for success. So, Anyway, make the long story short, I do believe we have something magical here, and, and I do think the signs of it now working in other regions is happening. And uh, um, you know, uh, areas like Hamburg and Paris and London, of course, are most famous for it, but um, I'm also very hopeful that this can happen in Iran. This is one of the, one of the most painful uh, things for me, which is uh, uh, I went to a, uh, as I told you, went to a Catholic Italian school, and these were wonderful Italian fathers that were running this. And every time, as alumni of that school, we meet with these fathers, you should see, I mean, they almost like spank us. They, they, they basically are like, if you guys don't go back to that country, who do you think is going to go fix it or help with it? Um, well, first of all, I think the attitude is in Iran is very different, which I think is correct. It's like, who are you guys who have lived most of your life and are practically Americans or foreigners to come tell these wonderful uh, energy and youth in Iran what to do? So I'm completely subscribed to that. I think, I, I think what I just hope for is that um, by these sanctions uh, going away, hopefully, and the country opening up so that the rest of the world can see the wonderful culture, the history, and the, the incredible talent base that's there. Uh, it pains me to see that we're not uh, uh, as successful as India or Turkey or some of these other countries. So I hope that kind of innovation from Silicon Valley can take root uh, in Iran as well. So two questions, what matters most to you and why? And when, when it comes time for you to retire, where, where, are, you gonna, where are you gonna spend your retirement? <laughs> <laughs> I think what matters to me most uh, at the end of the day is my, my family and my friends. So at the end of the day, when everything else goes away um, or everything else goes into perspective, what, what's most joyful is, is your friends and family. And so that's where I, where I love to spend most of my time and, I'm very protective of it these days, by the way, because I have the luxury now of picking what I want to do. And uh, again, this friend of mine always tortures me because whenever I slow down, he says, Omid, like, you know, you're like, you need to work harder. You need to do the next thing. And, uh, and I always like caution him that I now want to enjoy my young kids and my older kids who are in college uh, and my family a lot more uh, and the sports that I love. So um, those are what matters to me a lot, but also, I, I, I'm the kind of person I think will be uh, just not satisfied sitting at home or just retiring somewhere. I have to be, chal I have to be challenged and, and the luxury of being able to be part of this incredible innovative ecosystem of the valley and the technology field. 
I think is so special. The impact it's going to have on politics now, the impact it's going to have on uh, medicine, um, and the future of employment, I think, is profound. And I, I, I will always be involved with that. And, and I hope to support the future entrepreneurs and, and um, 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 be coaches and you know, board member or advisor to these, to these companies. Um, and as far as retiring anywhere, you know, honestly, this is something else that we struggle with, Zell and I, because we love this area. And then we go, we spend a year in London, and it's like, oh my God, it's so amazing, we should live in London. And then we go to New York, it's like, oh my God, this is so amazing, and we, should live in, we should live in New York. And, uh, and she's from France, so it's like, whenever I go to France, it's like, this is the best place on earth, and the culture is so similar to Iran. <laughs> we have this ongoing joke, all these Persian wars that are actually Persian, she claims are French. Uh, <laughs> like, Echantillon, Salbun, Douce. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, what I've realized is, you know, really home is where the, your relationships are. And, and that's what really matters to me is that spend time with my closest family and, and friends and that you can always travel or, you know, visit. And thanks to Airbnb now, you can just uh, really have a choice <laughs> around the world where you want to spend the more extended time. So uh, I think um, that's how I look at the world now, being a world citizen. Thank you. Let me go this side. Uh, hi, Amit. Uh, I have one question. You mentioned that uh, like tier A company hires tier A people, and like tier B company hires tier C people, and even worse. But what if you start with a tier B company? Or what if you start with a small company? I mean, that can be hard to f find these kind of tier A people. And what do you have some experience in that? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, but I was, what I was talking about was, yeah, it was the same kind of related point. But I was talking about individuals like tier A people, like A, a caliber employees, higher A caliber employees. Um, uh, I tell you, the only way out of it is to try to change the trend. Because if you are worried, and I've had these cases, by the way, in my career, where I, I always thought I'd get <coughs> And maybe it was just a false sense of confidence or just positive, positive outlook on life. I always thought I'd learn more and become better if I hire someone that's better than me. And that always worked for me and, and has worked cer certainly for Google. Uh, it doesn't mean they're better at everything than me, but uh, there's something about you rising your career that makes you special. But uh, I always em emphasize on doing that because if you don't do that, you end up with people that become protective of their careers. So if, I, if you don't hire an A caliber person, that next manager is more worried about protecting their position, he or she, than, than really propelling the company and the people uh, that they manage in that group or they work within a project with. So it goes back to that challenge, first of all, that mindset of I, I, I want to change this trajectory. I want to change the trajectory of this company and I want to take a risk on on, on, on being able to attract the kind of talent that's really going to be better than me and better than what we have here today. And it doesn't take, I don't think it takes much. If you're able to like, if there's a mission in that company or there's a focus and product that someone cares about, uh, you'll be surprised. You'll be able to attract those people because they come there for the mission and they come there for, for the opportunity to work with someone that has that same attitude and that same kind of passion for what you're doing. So I, I, don't, I agree with you, it's not easy, uh, and uh, it's, it's hard, especially if you're in an area where it's so, there's such competition for that A talent. Um, but sometimes, um, uh, you know, sometimes you may have to hire in different centers, um, in different locations. Uh, but I, I don't think companies that fall into this pattern of not hiring top talent will, can really survive long term. You know, it's just, I don't think they will be able to compete with uh, the, the best of the best. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, uh, my question is kind of r related to the concept of the mindset. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Iranians that have a little bit of anxiety and shyness. Uh, I was wondering if you can make a comment about how to overcome that in early in your career. Um, and the second question is, what's your ritual of success? Uh, what do you, you do or what did you do in your 30s that 
perhaps um, was a good ritual to have? Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, I'll give you something very personal on this. So I, um, even though I, I personally always had this very positive outlook on life and just always liked connecting with people, uh, I would say I was also shy early on. And maybe I still am in certain circumstances. I like to, you know, I'm not the kind of person that goes into a party and likes to talk to everyone. I, um, my friends say he does, but <laughs> I, I like to talk. I like to talk maybe to like five people and have a you know smaller conversation. But um, I would say there are two couple of things I learned. One is, and this is very personal now. I, when I came to Stanford, you know, I thought I'm so amazing. You know, I had this electrical engineering degree. I went to HP and I got into Stanford. I only applied to one business school and I got in and because I was so focused on Stanford. So I just thought that I'm walking on water and I almost failed the first like two, uh, I forget it was quarter or semester back then. I, I, I underestimated the talent around me. Like, you know, there, there were people that were Olympians. There were people that were bankers. And, and this, by the way, I hear happens to a lot of business school students during the first few months is you show up thinking you are really hot and then you kind of underestimate your classmates. And, and you know, I literally was about to fail. And there are a couple of things that happened. One is I had taken a course called Power and Politics, which is a controversial course by Professor Pfeffer here, because it talks about the, the role of power and politics and, and and I recommend you guys listen to his lectures and read it. And, and be careful with it because sometimes it, 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 draws, it draws lessons from politics and gover government and industry. But what it shows you is that the most successful people sometimes get really close to that ethical line. You know, they, they kind of push, push that line. And some people are very, you know, question that, you know, why are you teaching us this? Because I don't want to ever kind of get close to that line. And Professor Pfeffer had a beautiful line about it. And he said, you know, I just want you to be aware of what goes on, goes around in the world, because I don't want you to end up in a low point in your career and not realize what happened to you. You know, you, you don't have to necessarily play the game in the worst way, but you should be aware of the, the, the role of power and politics. So anyway, long way of saying this, as some of this teachings was going into my head, I realized that, you know, again, maybe it's because of my Iranian background or maybe it was because of my engineering background, a lot of times I'll be sitting in this class and I know the, knew the answer or I knew how to contribute and I wouldn't raise my hand. I just was kind of shy. I wasn't participating. I just wanted to like go do my work and turn it in. And, and I realized, you know, I just need to put myself out there. You just need to put yourself out there and make yourself uncomfortable again. So I started raising my hand. I would, you know, take risks, you know, put your hand up. And even if you're wrong, it's okay. You get noticed. I was shocked about how that level of participation and that level of putting yourself out there just dramatically changed me. And like my grades went up. The same thing happened in my career. You know, I, thought, I always thought you, know, you do great work, you get promoted, and uh, you, know, you, you propel yourself. But you have to get noticed. And to get noticed um, you know, at 3DO, I never forget, we were a company, we had a lot of issues, a lot of challenges. And there was this path I would take that was the closest path to my cubicle. I would like take this path and you know, go, go do, do this thing. And then suddenly Jeff, Jeff, the Dr. Pfeffer's lessons came to me. Like, you got to put yourself out. You got to get noticed. So I started, this is, sounds terrible, but I started taking the path through the executive row <laughs> to the exit. <laughs> and then one day, you know, the CEO of the company stopped and said, oh, hi, Omid, you know, I'm going to Japan. And I, I know you had worked in Japan before. Like, would you like to come on this trip because we have to deal with this issue? And, I mean, that little encounter changed my career there because it just showed me again by putting yourself out there, you open opportunities up for yourself. So again, you don't have to do it fake. You don't have to do it unethically, but you have to push yourself to, to be noticed, to, to uh, uh, take paths that are not necessarily the, 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 the easiest, but uh, take you down different experiences. Let's have a question from a lady. <laughs> uh, hi, Omid. Uh, I had just one question, and uh, my question is, uh, okay. uh, how do you introduce Omid Kordesani in just one sentence? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I'm going to use some of the I'm going to use some of the things that recently I've I've learned, and especially during this kind of attack on immigrants. So I'll probably think of myself now, introduce myself as, you know, I'm Iranian by birth, American by choice, and I am an uh, ever optimist. <laughs> Someone in the middle there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I have actually a couple of questions for you. Uh, first one is basically I want to have your um, idea or basically your advice for the uh, mainly like um, you know Iranian or immigrant student basically that come here for education. The first thing that uh, came to their mind is just basically we are at the beginning of education we are more worried about being settled down than taking risks for the like doing better. Yeah. You know? you know, I mean, having a better job. You're thinking about, okay, how I can, like, settle down, how I can have a, have, make my personal life, you know, fixed. So that, that's something that somehow I personally believe that kind of holding me to do the, the better thing, you know, because I'm always worried about what's going to happen. So what's your advice for us? Uh, that's my first, uh, basically, question. And the second one is this, uh, how do you rank your patients uh, when you're starting something? Mm. From one to ten, and yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thanks. Yeah. Sure. Um, so on the question of um, immigrants, first, so focus on getting settled down and surviving. Actually, uh, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, the it's so hard to come to a different country, away from your familiar surroundings, friends, family, and um, and I remember. I mean, those early days, I was really kind of in high school, especially with the revolution and the war and the Iranian hostage crisis, I was so kind of serious and inwardly focused. Uh, so I think there were a couple of things that were kind of my compass, uh, not just those early days, but kind of to your point about getting settled down. One is just really being passionate about something. And I was truly passionate about my electrical engineering degree. I was really loving every aspect of it um, and wanting to just learn and, and become better at it. Um, the second part was, again, surrounding myself with a strong community of friends. And um, I would say both the Persian community gave me this grounding and this familiarity that was so helpful for me early days, my, my, my friends and my relationships. We have this dear friend who said hello to me earlier today. I haven't seen him for a number of years, actually. Um, she. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for coming. But I never forget, she was this young girl that was a premature baby. And I actually got the pleasure of naming her Nahal. And uh, our dear friend accepted that name. And now she's a successful employee at Intel. And I'm sure a lot of great things ahead of her. But these relationships, these kind of community that was around me was just part of the roots that I established for myself that really, that really helped me. Uh, and I would say the third one is, you know, be a, be it a man or a woman, I think a partner in life is critical. And I had incredible, you know, incredibly strong women in my life, both you know, in college when I was growing up. I had, these, uh, amazing, uh, I had an amazing American girlfriend who was a huge influence on me to introduce me to this culture and have me not become so insular and enjoy the theater and uh, enjoy the city in San Francisco, kind of just really not become, not become like the China, you know, sometimes like the traditional immigration, immigrants where they have their own Chinatown or Koreatown or Persian town, you know, just get out of it and, and be part of the big broader society. Um, you know, this is one of the bad tendencies we have. You know, we go to the same parties with the same people, with the same jokes, with the same food, and the same dances at the end of the night. So get out of, the, get out of that rhythm and just actually, you know, be part of the broader uh, uh, community you're in. And, and then this partnership is really more, more I want to give credit to my, my ex-wife, Bita, who, who was just a strong woman in my life. And when I was in deep death and had gone through a couple of startups where I was uh, not doing so well with my career, she was a salesperson for MCI, back then a commun communications company, and she was selling lines of telephone. And she would bring home these like uh, bonus checks that were more than my entire salary for the year. And actually, it convinced me that I'm in the wrong job. I was doing product. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm here I am working on product strategy, and it sounds great, but I'm making $40,000 a year. And she brought a $40,000 bonus check. So 
So, by the way, that honestly, that was one of the big influences on me moving to the revenue side. <laughs> so, so I would say, you know, those things, you know, really that community, loving what you do, um, exposing yourself beyond that community, and then a, a strong partner in life. You know, just having the having starting your life, having children, having you know, marriage, and, and just getting into that rhythm just is part of life and you learn from it, you grow with it, uh, you take risks for it because you want a better life for your kids and I would say all those things is, is an important consideration. Yeah. I think we might have to do a second session here with all the great questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts about some of the folks uh, within a certain age still in Silicon Valley looking for a career? And, you know, as you know, once you get over 50 or 55, but you're not quite at your retirement age, your salary expectation is higher, experience is higher. Meantime, you're slowing down. Companies are hiring younger folks. And, you know, there are a group of people who are facing a challenge to move between the company, get new jobs that are at the same level as they're trained for. So what can those guys do to, you know, make the next move on their career? Yeah. I think that's really tough. You're right. I mean, this is a challenge that companies have and I think employees have if, if that it's, if, if you haven't taken some of the, not you specifically, I'm just talking generally, but if people haven't taken those risks early on in their career and kind of made themselves uncomfortable, then they do end up in these positions where they become either dated or less, relevant of the times and that's that's a dangerous position to be in and I the only recommendation I have is a and I know these are hard this is not easier said than done but a is just f uh, trying to retool yourself trying to like really find uh, a, even even if you have to take a step back sometimes and go into a to a role that's but it's in the in the right company it's a different environment that actually has more chance of success I think I think it's better than than kind of staying stagnant in a in an industry I have, I, I, have, I have my own, you know, a couple of really close friend, friends of mine that, you know, chose lifestyle over um, career. You know, they chose lifestyle and, you know, without embarrassing them now by <laughs> giving more data points out. Uh, it's, it's just like they, they just didn't make those hard, harsh moments. You know, I, I sometimes thought I'm going to die with the pressures of some of these startups I was under. Uh, but I think those things made me str stronger and better over time. So... I would just say it's really assessing your strengths, <coughs> assessing the network that you have, um, and using it all to, to then make the next move so that you, you put yourself in the flow of what's happening now. It's really the best advice I have. So forgetting the title or forgetting necessarily even the income that maybe you were expecting, but taking that next risk that puts you in a stronger flow. Maybe do a couple more questions and then, because yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to come back. <laughs> yeah. Let's have another question from a lady in the middle here. As you can see, I'm very biased toward having the right di diversity. <laughs> I have two daughters. <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, if you're looking to hire f someone, like what's the most important quality that you're looking in that person? Yeah, I think um, that I, honestly the most important thing I look for is does this person have the ability to... Um, to grow and to really kind of challenge not only themselves, but the company and their manager and so forth. So I look at the capability of this person to really uh, uh, not necessarily do today's job because the, everything is moving so fast. Um, and I'll, sh I'll share the Sheryl Sandberg story because this is a, actually relates to your question also about Sheryl. So Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook now and you know, she's a world figure now, uh, she was brought into Google by Eric Schmidt, our CEO, CEO, to get the company ready for going public. She came from the government. She was in the Treasury Department, just a <coughs> superstar, you know, education and talent. And very quickly, she got frustrated because we weren't ready to go public. It was years away. And, 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 and she just like kind of really started thrashing around <laughs> like, you know, she didn't have a job and, and uh, she wasn't sure what she's going to do. And, and I was about to, I was running the business and I, I was about to do this mega partnership with AOL where all of the most advanced advertisers online were going to come to Google. And, and I, I, I used to say, you know, I don't even, I, don't, I need the manual. I need like, because, you know, the, yeah, imagine those days where these advertisers will come and 
advertise on Google and what if there are, uh, you know, porn sites? What if there are pharmaceutical sites that you don't, you have to reject? What if, what if there are, you know, the proper, um, you know, basically these policies are on advertising, policies are on how do you accept these advertisers, optimize them, make them better and so forth. So it's a kind of a very important job, but it's a tedious job. It's like a job of hiring a lot of smart people who can, who can, well, traditionally it's a job of like doing a, maybe a call center where you, you know, outsource this and have somebody else do this for you based on a manual you give them and a training you give them. Well, Cheryl was running around and came to my office and, and I knew she's a superstar and she doesn't have a job. And, and, and she said, Omid, uh, can you help me? And I said, well, I have, the only senior job I have is this role, but to me, I need a tractor and you're like a Porsche. <laughs> 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 and, and, and she said, Omid, I can be a Porsche tractor for you. So <laughs> I said, um, are, are you sure you want this job and are you gonna do it? And then she told me, you know, and by the way, it's really interesting because she's on the board of Disney today. So I mean, you may not know this about me, but my ideal job is to figure out how to make the lines at Disneyland shorter. You see, I love operations. I like to figure out the efficiency of lines and all of this. And I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I need. So I gave her that role and the rest is sister. I mean, she's just like, instead of doing a call center, she hired the most smart group of um, people with language skills, with um, fantastic education that to this day is one of the assets of Google, this large organization that manages our advertisers and operations. Anyway, my point there is when I looked at Cheryl, I didn't, she didn't have any experience in that job. She didn't have any experience, you know, doing um, ad operations. Uh, I just bet on this smart woman that can do anything. <laughs> and is, is she willing to do this job? So I look for that. I look, I, I, I look for, and especially if you are trying to apply for a job, look to demonstrate to someone that you're not about today's job. You're, you, you can, you're smart and you can figure this out, but you, you're a lot more than that. And you can, you can, you know, your career and the ways you're going to expand the opportunities within the company is broader than the job at, at hand today. One last question. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> you pick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alex said I got. Uh, thank you for coming here on meet. Um, I have uh, like a broad question for you. Uh, do you think that too much talent is concentrated on the internet uh, today? Because what really bothers me that we all have these wonderful computers in our pockets, but we're still like driving on bridges and highways that are falling apart. So what's your what's your what's your take on that? Thank you. Yeah, good question. I I I, I look. I think this. Uh, it's true that there's this amazing concentration of talent in our industry. And I, but on the other hand, I feel like what's great about it is that this technology field is now touching every industry, right? From medicine to, um, you know, genetics to um, transportation now and, um, you know, hotel businesses, everything is getting touched by it. Um, on, a, on a related comment though, I do hope that, uh, especially when people have the right career, and I saw this happen at Google a lot, is, um, is, is this talent actually started going to different industries, you know, trying to even go into the government and take positions in the US government to help. So I do think uh, it's great that we have this talent. I, I, I do hope that not only do we intelligently help these other industries, but also um, over time be willing to help the other parts of our, our, our country and our industry. Because I completely agree with you, and this is probably the one thing I agree with President Trump these days, is uh, you know this comp con country's infrastructure is just like embarrassing compared to the rest of the world, and and so the kinds of innovations that we can do and the kinds of contributions we can make to that uh, is is uh, uh, is pretty significant and it's, it's a great opportunity I feel. So thank you so much. I, I love spending time with you and connecting with you, and hope to do that in the future again. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Absolutely.